What you think is a limiter is actually three or four limiters all packed into one plugin, plus a whole bunch of other stuff going on underneath the hood. In this video, I'm gonna show you how these modern limiters actually work. I'm gonna talk about the recommended settings, the best practices, how you can get faster, cleaner, and if you want to, louder results. We're gonna take a look at three of the most popular and three of my favorite limiters, FabFilter Pro L2, Sonable Smart Limit, and DMG Limitless. Let's get into it. The first thing to understand is that a limiter is basically a control of volume on a per sample basis with a big brain attached to it. And the purpose of that big brain and all the CPU resources that go into it is to make the smoothest gain change possible on a per sample basis such that you're uh, eliminating as much distortion as you can. This is very different behavior from something like a clipper, which is just creating a hard ceiling and shearing off the audio which will create distortion. A limiter tries its best to, through look ahead, to see the incoming audio coming in and to make the gain changes as smoothly as possible so that you are reducing distortion, okay? The second thing to understand is that all of these modern limiters that are mastering grade limiters are brick wall limiters. Some people get confused by seeing an attack parameter and they think that that works similar to a compressor that will let part of the signal through before the gain reduction is applied. And that is not the case. The first limiter that we're going to talk about, the main limiting stage, actually has two stages. It's, it's like you can think of it like two limiters in one, it's not actually two limiters. But it is a transient detection stage, which handles these very quick micro events. And there is a dynamics limiter, which functions a little bit more like a compressor. It's not a compressor, but it functions more like a compressor. Okay, and that is where the attack and release comes in. So regardless of what comes into this limiter, it's going to take care of a brick wall at whatever the output is set to, okay? And then the attack and release control the release circuits or the dynamic section of the limiter. So it is kind of two limiters in one, but what's happening is both of those calculations are feeding together into a single multiply that's happening on a per sample basis. And that's important because if you had one calculation happening for the transient limiter and then a whole second set of calculations happening, it could adjust gain in a way that wasn't optimizing for the minimum amount of distortion. Okay, so that's the first big one to get is that there's a transient stage and then there's a dynamic stage. And the transient stage is controlled by uh, the look ahead. So look ahead is going to allow the limiter to see the incoming audio a little bit ahead and react by the time that audio event gets there. And in terms of looking um, at this parameter and setting it, um, the lower this parameter goes, and if it goes to zero, it is going to become like a clipper. And in fact, you can set this limiter like a clipper if you put release all the way up, attack all the way down and set it to zero look ahead, it is going to be a hard clipper now. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to do that, but uh, that's what it'll do. If you want to avoid distortion, what FabFilter says, and what a lot of companies say, is that you should be, uh, you know, 0.2 milliseconds, 0.1 milliseconds at least. If you go less than that, you run the risk of having a gain change that is so abrupt that it can cause distortion, okay? So how does the transient stage release? Well, in a lot of limiters, they have the release time of the transient stage, the same as or very similar to the amount of look ahead. Uh, that's how it functions in DMG Limitless. So if we open Limitless for a second, you'll see I have a look ahead of 0.5 milliseconds. The release time of that is going to be almost or exactly 0.5 milliseconds on the transient stage of that limiter. Okay, so that kind of covers the, the transient stage and the dynamic stage. But I said that there are three or four limiters in one, right? And, uh, and there are. So that's where we get into peak limiting that's happening with oversampling, okay? So if you engage oversampling, it's going to upsample the signal and then anytime you have to downsample back to your a lower project sample rate, and it's going through an anti-aliasing filter, it's gonna be band limiting the signal. It generates overshoots that exceed the ceiling. And so you need another limiting stage after every step of downsampling. So it's typically a very, very fast limiter or maybe a clipper in some implementations. And that's gonna prevent, because this limiter is designed to be last in chain, as a mastering limiter and there can't be the possibility of any overshoots. So it has a second limiting stage that will happen after the downsampling to cut those 
oversamples or those, what am I saying? To cut the overshoots, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. All right, so um, where's the third and the fourth limiter, okay? Well, the third limiter is true peak limiting. So in order to be compliant with the uh, ITU that talks about uh, true peak limiting, you have to have it as a second limiter that's after the first limiting stage. So it reads the output of the first limiter and then it upsamples it to, in this case, eight times. It has to be a minimum of four times for the ITU, but eight times is the implementation in FabFilter Pro L2. And then it downsamples it back to your project sample rate again. So, so you're limiting the signal in the in the true peak stage. And then because it's downsampling again, you're limiting again to take care of overshoots. Okay, so you you have all of these additional limiting stages. So let's take a look at how I would set each one of these limiters up. In a mastering session, I would have a variety of other plugins before the limiter, but uh, we're just going to do kind of quick and dirty, and I'm going to show you just a few of the favorite settings that I have and, and best practices with these. So I'm going to put each one of the limiters to uh, 3 dB of gain into their circuit, so we're kind of matching the amount of limiting happening in each one. And I've got this hip-hop track uh, spooled up that uh, we're going to be working with. I'll just play a little clip of it. Awesome. One of the biggest decisions you're going to make is the style. The style controls a lot of the other aspects of the limiter and how it works. I like modern. I like aggressive for the styles of music that I work with. I usually start with modern and then go from there. And uh, they will quite radically change the sound of the limiter and they'll have more of an effect the more limiting you're doing. Next is look ahead. And um, like I said before, if you're using a, a small amount of look ahead, you run the risk of uh, getting into distortion. Usually the sweet spot with this limiter and the way I use it, about 0.2 milliseconds is enough to prevent distortion while still being super loud if I want it to be loud and clean. Uh, the attack and release, what do those do? The attack determines the timing of when the release envelope will kick in and that dynamic stage of the limiter. And then the release determines how long the release is like a compressor and if you set the attack longer then it's going to preserve the transients better and be louder if you set the release shorter it's also going to be louder just like a compressor and allow the transients to be less suppressed so you do need to kind of thread the needle with this stuff and usually i would start with uh, a bit of a longer attack and a bit of a shorter release but not in the extreme okay Cool. I'm not going to mess with true peak limiting or oversampling right now, um, but I will talk about the loudness monitoring that happens because it's important to know uh, where that's sitting, especially if you're mastering for a certain target. I don't usually do that, but if you are, it's good to know how loud your master is and uh, the output level. So if I'm mastering for a streaming platform and I need to leave a certain amount of margin, I would probably use true peak limiting if it's a streaming platform, and then I would leave the margin that is required. Uh, but in this case, I'm not doing this. This is going to be for a WAV file export. It's not going to be compressed. And it's going to be for DJ play. So I'm going to go right up to negative 0.1. Okay. And then uh, you have the ability to choose momentary, short-term, or integrated LUFs. I usually leave it at integrated or short-term if I'm making changes and I need to see it updating. But I usually leave it as integrated and then I can clear it. And uh, where are we sitting? The reference songs that I work with in this genre, stuff like... Uh, Suicide Boys, Carrollton, um, Mr. Carmack stuff, um, Childish Gambino, Sweatpants. It's all sitting at around, um, well, some of it's louder than others, but the hip-hop songs are usually around negative 8, negative 9. Negative 9 is a good sweet spot that allows the 808 to breathe. The louder you make something, the less bass you have, the more you have to sacrifice bass when you push into loudness. So I find this is a good sweet spot to be in to let that 808 breathe on the bottom. So uh, yeah, here's where we are. Nice. So that's Pro L2. Now let's take a look at Sonable Smart Limit. So don't be fooled by the interface, but Sonable Smart Limit is actually the simplest limiter out of this lineup to use. And that's because it's what they call a content aware limiter. You can literally just go here, choose your genre. We'll go hip hop contemporary, click learn, 
and it's going to automatically learn the settings that it needs to conform the master to the genre based on a ton of songs that it's analyzed. Let's try it out. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to take the ceiling and take it all the way up because that actually does create more limiting if you drop the ceiling. And I'm going to set it to be the same, negative 0.1. On the output, that doesn't create more limiting. Okay, so this is the actual margin that you can set there. And then uh, apples to apples, I'm going to push up the gain so that we get 3 dB of gain into the limiter, just like we did with FabFilter Pro L2. And then uh, over here, you can see it's set the attack and it's set the release to auto. And that is basically the equivalence of these parameters right here, the attack and release. So it also has a transient detection circuit that's brick walled and it has the dynamic section as well. So it's a two stage limiter. Yeah, let's have a listen to that. And over here, while we're listening, you can see the dynamics is on the X axis and the loudness is on the Y. And you can see where it sits relative to a target. In this case, I'm going to use a manual target. I'm going to type in negative nine because that's about where the other master was uh, sitting, right? So let's see how it looks. Right on. Love that. It can be that simple. All right. Now, it does have a lot of more complicated features under the hood that you can use to uh, customize the sound uh, or just go deeper into what it's doing. It has distortion monitoring that will show distortion in uh, red. Just because there's some stuff flashing there doesn't mean it's bad. There's a certain amount of distortion that is expected in uh, electronic music and hip hop and stuff like that. So especially loud stuff. And then, uh, yeah, it's got styles. So similar to how with Pro L, it had these styles, but they're discrete. You have to click into different ones. This style from soft to hard is uh, continuously variable. So this is, you can think of these as scrolling through, morphing through all the different styles that you might get in a different limiter. Saturation inflates low level material and functions kind of like a sonics inflator or in the gold clip plugin the gold parameter uh it, it, it inflates the low level material without touching the peaks so it's almost kind of like uh, upwards compression as well and then uh, we have the uh, balance and bass controls um so if you take a look here this is uh going to perform a spectral function right so it's going to break it up into a series of bands uh, and it's going to be able to adjust the brightness uh, and tame resonances. So use with caution. You have to really use these carefully if you're going to start adjusting the spectral balance of your mix. And then bass control. So this can enhance the low end. Let's just see what that sounds like, given that this is a hip hop song. Nice. And then it's got a quality check. So again, this is one of those kind of help you out automatic features that can give you tips. So if we play it and click quality check, it's going to give us tips on, on what it thinks we should do. Right on. So it, it thinks we're, we're on par with where we need to be, which is great. Now, the final thing I'll show you that it can do is you can take a reference song and just drag it onto the interface. And that reference song will now become the target. Okay. Instead of the general hip hop profile, it's going to. Yeah. So it's going to tell me that the, the loudness of that song is actually higher than where I'd set it to. And it thinks we need to push up the gain. So it can be really useful. And um, I love that. Great. That is smart limit. Now let's flip over to our final limiter, DMG Limitless. Limitless um, probably has the most intimidating interface and it is the most complex and uh, deep and difficult limiter to learn. But it's my primary limiter that I use for, for mastering. Um, and uh, I 
can make it look simpler <laughs> for you. This is a multiband limiter. Uh, so the main differences between um, using limitless and using Pro L2 is that Pro L2 is a single band limiter um, and that it has oversampling. And DMG Limitless is a multiband limiter and it doesn't have oversampling. Um, it has figured out a way in the algorithm that it causes less distortion in some cases than limiters with oversampling. Now, uh, that actually brings up a question is I should talk about oversampling in Smart Limit. So you'll notice that there is no oversampling anywhere and there's no look ahead in Smart Limit. It doesn't mean that there isn't look ahead, there is look ahead but uh, it's happening underneath the hood. And so where some of these limiters are very manual and you can dig in and control these things, this is more of a do it for you limiter. And uh, I mean, the results speak for themselves. Um, many of my colleagues have encouraged me to look at this limiter because they have said that it produces the least amount of distortion of any limiter on the market. Um, I haven't tested that personally, but uh, it certainly sounds very clean to me. And um, there is oversampling that is happening, uh, upsampling and downsampling throughout the limiter at different stages it's just all happening underneath the hood and as a user you don't have control over that which might be great for you if you don't want to fuss with that stuff which not everybody does um this is this is great it's going to do it for you but in limitless it's a unique animal because it does not have oversampling unless you're talking about if unless you click on uh this isp function here which is their version of true peak limiting and that's going to oversample four times um, at a separate limiter stage but in the main limiter, there is no oversampling. And I actually was really curious about that when I first got this plugin and I was reading the manual, I was like, where's oversampling? And I searched the manual and literally there's no mention of oversampling uh, except with respect to the clipper, um, which I'm, I don't use in this plugin. It's a pre-limiter clipper. I use other clippers. I don't use this clipper. And so I reached out to Limitless and I had a long chat back and forth with, with Dave Gamble, um, one of the creators. And he said to me, he said, well, the reason why most limiters have oversampling is to curtail aliasing and to deal with distortion he said we took a different approach we just designed a limiter that doesn't create very much distortion or aliasing in the first place and the way that they do that is a deep dive that i don't think i really want to go into here but it comes back to that initial principle i was telling you about which is they they create the least amount of gain change possible in the amount of time that they have they, or rather they smooth the gain change so that it isn't wave shaping and producing distortion and thus aliasing. Now, the other aspect of this limiter that makes it so that it produces less aliasing and distortion is the fact that it's multiband. They can distribute the gain reduction across the bands so that one band doesn't penalize another band, so to speak. Yeah. So let's take a look at how I set this up. So this works a bit different. It doesn't have a gain that you push up into a fixed threshold. It has a threshold you drop down into the signal. So rather than getting a plus 3 dB push into the limiter, I'm going negative 3 dB so it matches, okay? Then here is the ceiling. And like the other uh, limiters, I'm gonna go negative 0.1 so that we have the same margin or ceiling. And uh, when, you, when you reduce this, it does not trigger more limiting. Okay, let's just show that. It's just a output volume control, okay? So that's important to understand about your limiter is what is that doing? Okay, then release. This uh, limiter has no attack parameter, unlike Smart Limit and Pro L2. It just has release. So that's the um, release envelope timing and um, it also does have a transient stage that's brick wall and a dynamic stage so it, it does have that two stage limiting but they both feed into one multiplier for each sample in terms of gain now um, this limiter has a look ahead function that's down here so if i set what did i set look ahead to 0.2 okay i'll set look ahead to 0.2 0.2 okay and uh the the again just to reiterate the transient stage the look ahead determines how far ahead it's going to see and make that gain change okay so you want to have enough room there that it's smooth enough that's not creating distortion and then the amount of time that the transient stage takes to release is equal to the look ahead time okay now 
Um, if you want to make this limiter more simple, you don't need to go under the hood like I'm doing in manual mode. You can click and it has these styles, just like the other two limiters we looked at. So hip hop, what might we want? Maybe aggressive, maybe punchy. If you want to take a look at what these are doing and learn the limiter a bit better, you can click on these and you can click on this again and go copy to manual. Okay. And then you can open up the manual area and you can see it's changed all of these settings. And so you can go aggressive, copy to manual, and you can see how it's changed these. So that, that's what the styles are doing. They're changing and scaling these parameters. Now, uh, what do we want to do here? Let, let's just listen to it out of the box um, with that style. Nice. So you can see over on the right here, we have loudness monitoring in, in LUFS. That's integrated LUFS there. And then we have uh, True Peak monitoring as well uh, over there. And uh, let's take a look through here. There's some parameters that we haven't seen before, and these are uh, unique to Limitless, partially due to the fact that it's multiband. Okay, input trim, not going to change that. Slope, that's the slope of the crossovers that are uh, in between each one of the bands here. These crossovers, for anybody who wants to nerd out on them, are... Um, Linkwitz Riley linear phase crossovers. Okay, so these are using a two cascading Butterworth filters for each uh, of these crossover high pass low pass points and their linear phase. Now um, separation. This is the amount of band independence. So how much one band can affect another. Okay, so you can scale that up and down. Stereo linking. Um, that is a parameter I'm just going to leave the same, leave it default on all the limiters. Look ahead, okay? It set this to zero. Definitely don't want that. That's distortion territory. I want to use at least 0.2. So I'm going to use 0.2 milliseconds there. Knee uh, can ease the limiting in. You can introduce a limiting knee. Usually don't use it. Weighting, this is one that I do use a lot. So at 100, it's going to optimize for perceptual loudness, which means it might penalize the base a little bit more than you want it to. And if you take this parameter and you go negative 100 and go beyond that, now it's going to optimize for base versus perceptual loudness. So it's going to limit the base less, which actually is probably appropriate for a hip hop song. Okay, let's, uh, let's listen to this. Nice. Okay. And then release shape determines the shape, logarithmic, inverse log, or linear of the release envelope. And then dynamics, this is actually a really significant parameter. So this determines how much of the gain reduction is going to be handled by the release circuits. And the release circuits are the ones that are multiband. So if you take this to zero, limitless will function like a single band limiter. Now, if you take this parameter and you jack it all the way up, it's going to be much more multiband sounding, which can EQ your mix, re-EQ your mix. Okay, so I usually find a, a sweet spot in there is, you know, 35% to 50% is usually where, where I'm at with that. And uh, that's where I sit. Now, given that this is multiband, you can also go in here and you can fuss with the individual limiting settings for each one of the bands. You can change the crossovers and uh, all that stuff. But uh, a lot of times I, I actually don't do that. I haven't found many cases where I feel like I need to play with the, the, band, the bands a lot, usually because my mastering limiter is actually not doing very much work, right? I use clipping in my mix. I use saturation in my mix. I use limiters in my mix where I need to on buses. And that gets me very, very loud before I even hit my mastering chain. Like I think this, uh, in the uh, louder sections of this song, the, the mix itself is negative 10 luffs. So I've done that in the mix, okay? So now, uh, yeah, let's just have a listen now that all the settings are in. Sweet. So there is a description of how these modern limiters work, a deep dive underneath the, the hood, really, and dissecting what makes them tick, and then an uh, introduction to workflow in each one of them. Hope you guys got a lot out of that. 
I'll maybe drop a quick little A, B, C, so you can actually compare between all of the different limiters. Let's do that now. Brilliant. So this video is actually part of a series that I'm doing on limiters and how to get better with them and the limiters that I love and the settings that I use to be able to get great results. I will put a link in the video description and in the pinned comment on this video to that playlist. Watch that next and check out the other videos that I have on limiters. I wanted to ask you guys for some support actually. If you're in a financial position to be able to help me, uh, support me in creating more videos, I have created a kind of Patreon-like tier where you guys can give me a few bucks each month. I've changed my focus and I'm doing these videos as my primary thing. I really want to just increase the rate at which I'm making videos and do videos that normally I'd be charging money for in paid online courses, but I want to stop that and just really get the barriers out of the way and I want to impact more people. And the best way I can do that is on YouTube and I just want to keep everything free for you guys. So of the you out there who have the financial means or in the financial position to be able to help support me in that goal, I would greatly appreciate it. You can check out the link in the video description and the comments. And then uh, even if you just want to send me something one time, there's the super thanks button that uh, just keeps it all on the YouTube platform right below this video too. Thank you so much for watching. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked this one. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments and subscribe to the channel if you are not already. And I'll catch you guys on the next video. Much love.